All right, good evening everyone and welcome to another MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar. My name is Hilary and I work for the facilitators of the webinars, Aggregate Consulting. Tonight we're joined by David Crowley of Delta Agribusiness who will be taking us through phosphorus application in mixed farming. If you haven't joined us before, uh, just a bit of housekeeping to start with. This control panel will be at the top right corner of your screen. The red arrow button on the left collapses and reinstates the control panel so you can get a better look at the slides this evening. You should be able to hear us, but we can it, cannot hear you. So please type your questions as David goes through the presentation this evening in the box provided. I will relay them to Dave at the end of the webinar, so please make your questions as succinct as possible. For those who are wondering, these webinars are recorded and are available at a later date on the MLA website. Just to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, David Crowley from Delta Agribusiness. David is a senior farm consultant with Delta Ag. He has a Master of uh, Agricultural Business Management. David's been with Delta Ag in Young for just over 12 years now and has worked for Landmark in Northern New South Wales prior to that. David works predominantly with mixed farms around Young, Harden, Quandiala, Carragable uh, in New South Wales with farms ra ranging from 400 to 650 mil annual rainfall. So it's great to have David with us this evening to take us through a phosphorus application in mixed farming. I will make Dave the uh, presenter now and he can get started when it pops up. Uh, Dave, something should come up now. Yep. Okay, you'll just have to swap the screens again. Yep, no worries. Righto, how are we looking? Awesome, thanks David. Righto, thanks Hilary. So, phosphorus in mixed farming is the brief I've been given. I plan to focus on phosphorus in pastures predominantly. Um, when I started to put this presentation together, I thought, well, this is a, a simple, straightforward topic, but the further I went down it, there's a lot of different rabbit holes we can go down. Uh, I'll try and cover a few of those tonight. Uh, as I said, I'll focus on phosphorus in pastures. Also talk a little bit on phosphorus coming out of crop. If I can change my next slide. All right, we're away. So the plan tonight is to talk through how to go about assessing your phosphorus resource. So sounds quite simple but I'll talk as a starting point how to go about assessing where you're at on your farm also working out what your removal is so from the reason for doing that is trying to work out how much we need to put in to maintain that phosphorus reserve uh, how much we need to put in if we want to build it and if we happen to be in the happy position of having luxury levels what we can do or how long we can potentially mine that reserve for uh, to do that I'll also talk through calculating DSEs uh, at a at a basic level, set some target levels and also just touch on coming out of crop and the implications that might have for your pasture rotation and also then just touch on pH which obviously interacts with phosphorus and also your rainfall environment. So for the purposes of this talk I'm going to focus on the Young Harden area. So this is where I spend most of my time, uh, an area if you're not familiar with it 550 to 650 mil winter rainfall our soil type is a red candazole. We do have some granite pockets throughout the district and typically our winter stocking rates. So our winter DSEs, which I'll talk more about later on, range from about seven and a half to 14 DSE per hectare. So a little bit like cropping results, that's a fair range, but it's, uh, it's back to that phosphorus base, the pasture base, and also the willingness of the individual to push the system. So I'll talk a bit more about how that uh, how you can manage that and hopefully get towards that top end of carrying capacity. Uh, also in our area, we're typically, as I think Hillary alluded to, typically 50-50 crop pasture. 
Uh, we're a mix of perennial grass-based pastures, so phalaris, fescue, clover-type pastures, and also loosened clover, loosened clover pastures or legume-dominant pastures. Typically, that's a 60-40 mix, so 60% grass-based, 40% loosened clover-based, uh, but that does change as you move from east to west. So as you go west and the rainfall drops off a little bit, uh, they tend to be more focused on loosened clover-based pastures. In our part of, the, part of the world, we have minimal areas of native pastures because the country's mostly arable. We can run more on those improved pastures. So, so that's what we tend to do. So with this talk, all the numbers that I'll quote are focused on what we can do in our area of Southern New South Wales. It will change relative to your soil type. So a little bit of a disclaimer there, and I'll, I'll talk about how you can adjust those numbers as well. So why phosphorus? Um, obviously there's a bit of interest here tonight. I see we've just ticked over 100 attendees. So for something seemingly simple, it's an input that drives production and it's something that we can improve the management of. So I think we're really good at managing this in crops, but often once we get out of the cropping phase into the pasture phase, it's something that we throw out a bit of single and don't think too much more about it. But pasture yield, much like cropping yield, is a factor of the most limiting nutrient. So, which tends to be the, one of these big three as a rule. So, phosphorus, sulfur, and nitrogen. So, in pasture systems, typically nitrogen supplied by the legume base, so whether it be lucerne or our clover base. And if you think of nitrogen as the engine for the pasture system, phosphorus and sulfur are the fuel that goes in that engine. So, without the fuel, the engine can't fire. So, if you look at that, you've probably seen that bucket before, but Production is going to be, assuming that we're moisture permitting, production is going to be a factor of that most limiting nutrient. And more commonly than not, that's phosphorus. Um, obviously, that's going to be the focus of the talk. I will just touch briefly on sulphur. So as I said, phosphorus and sulphur are the fuel that go in the engine to drive that nitrogen production and make sure we've got biomass production. Uh, you can get sulphur either in the elemental or sulphate form. So all that means is sulphate, what you get in single super is plant available. It's not necessarily good or bad. Elemental is more of a slower release. So it's got to convert by microbial activity to become plant available. So you can find fertilizers that are a mix of both, single super sulfate, something like triple plus, for example, has a bit of sulfate and a little bit of elemental sulfur. So they're just important factors to consider depending where you're at with your fertility history and the, uh, the pasture mix you've got on your farm. And again, why sulfur? It's a constituent of protein. It's necessary for photosynthesis. Uh, it also helps legumes fix nitrogen. So we tend to see sulfur deficiency in legumes before we do grasses, but it's still a really important part of the whole system. You can get it, as I said, in single super, triple plus, or potentially gypsum if you're just looking for a straight sulfur source. So that's probably enough about sulfur and back to the, the main event. Just talking around phosphorus, just wanting to establish some basic rules of thumb. So if you have no information about your farm, you go new farm or you haven't soil tested for a while, go and grab a soil test. If that coal or pea reading comes back below 25, it's extremely deficient and you're going to get a big response to phosphorus fertilizer. So it's a no-brainer to go and do it. If you're in that 20 to 30, 25 to 35 range, which hopefully most of you will be, you're still going to be quite responsive and get a good, good bang for your buck. If you're in that 35 to 45 range, or you could even argue 30 to 45 range, you're at the, a desirable level and we want to maintain that. Ideally, we don't want to drop below that. If you are, do happen to be lucky enough to be over 45, which sometimes we are coming out of the cropping phase, then you may have the opportunity to actually mine that phosphorus reserve and give fertilizer a miss for a year. So why those rules of thumb and those particular benchmarks? Um, you can see here the graph is, of, is about maximising pasture growth rate. So to do that, we want to be at about 95% of potential production. And to do that, we need to be at around that sort of 35 to 45 critical cold wool pea level. So that in the spring when we've got good moisture, and hopefully we will again this year, we've got maximum feed production growing and we can turn off fat stock and make some money. So I've adapted my own version of this. Um, 
I'll talk about it at the end as far as resources to go and review some of this stuff if you want to look at more detail. There's a really good publication called The Five Easy Steps uh, to Making Money from Superphosphate. So five steps to getting the most out of single super. Um, they talk about spring DSEs. I've adapted that to winter DSEs, uh, partly because I think it's, they're easy to calculate winter DSEs. And again, you can see if you're sitting in this 35 to 45 coal P range, you're pretty close to maximising your potential. We're up towards the top of this curve and still getting an economic response. So in our part of the world, we range, as I said, from sort of seven and a half to about 14 DSE. But if you're going to try and push your DSE or your carrying capacity, then you need to be up in this higher end of the fertility scale. So just to put that in some context, this is a summary of all of the Intertech uh, pasture soil tests, the phosphorus results from January 2020 through till about a week ago. So there's about 700 tests here. And if we just hone in, about let's say a quarter of them are in that luxury level. So they're in a position where they may be able to mine that phosphorus reserve if they so desire. And I have frozen. Bear with me. Uh, so the next uh, the next tier there, 30 to 45 coal wool P is about 18%, caught 20% in that range, which I would call the ideal production zone that we want to maintain. And the thing to remember here, this is all the tests that have been submitted to Intertech. So this is all the tests that people are actually going to the trouble of measuring. So there's a lot of country out there that is likely to be on the lower end of that scale. So if you focus on the yellow um, part of that graph, 15 to 29, about 30% of all the samples tested were at that level. Uh, sorry, just having a little technical difficulty here, moving slides along. Righto, we're back on. So around 58% of paddocks tested in 2020 are going to be extremely responsive to fertiliser. So if you haven't been testing, get out there, grab a few tests and set a baseline so that you know um, the old saying, you can't manage what you don't measure. So get out and do some measurements, set a baseline, and that's your platform to make some decisions around fertiliser, whether it be single super, a newer, triple plus, name your product. Uh, if you haven't got a baseline test, then it's pretty hard to know how much and how regularly to put it out. So at a more practical level in our area, this is an example of a farm that I deal with. So uh, just recently we went and took a soil test out of all of the pasture paddocks. So the paddocks not coloured in are in crop this year. And the reason for doing this, we found we we're keeping pretty good track record of the paddocks going to crop, but we weren't testing regular, regularly enough in the pasture paddocks. We've been putting out single super, but we wanted to establish a baseline to say, are we putting out enough, too much? Uh, can we drive production harder? So you'll notice the dark blue paddocks where we've got 49 and 50 coal wool P, they happen to be the most recent paddocks out of pasture. And on this Western end, this chunk of the farm has actually been out to pasture for uh, about six years now. And it's probably our next part of the farm that will come back into crop, but there's still some quite good pastures there. So we want to be in a position to then assess that pasture composition and say, well, where we've lost the desirable species, we may bring those back into crop, but where we've got really good clover population, good phalaris, fescue, lucin, we may be able to extend that the life of that pasture rotation and continue to drive livestock production. So we've got our baseline. The next place to go is to start thinking about removal of phosphorus. So I tend to work on a removal number of half a kilo of phosphorus per DSC. Uh, in various literature, you may lay your hands on, you may hear them quote 0.7 or even as high as 1.1. And that's going to depend on your soil type. Uh, it's also going to depend on your phosphorus buffer index of your particular soil. But in my part of the world, in Southern New South Wales, about half a kilo of phosphorus per DSE we run, and that's talking winter DSEs, seems to be about the number. So if we decide that we want to increase our coal wool P, we need to apply an excess of two kilos of phosphorus 
to increase that coal wool P by one unit. And again, depending on your soil type, that, that number may be higher. But for the, for the sake of this demonstration and this argument, uh, we'll work on two kilos of excess phosphorus to increase coal wool P by one unit. So that brings me to DSE ratings. Uh, a lot of people I deal with get a little bit nervous when you start talking DSE ratings and worry that they're hard to work out. Again, I would say it's better to be roughly right than accurately wrong. So if we talk about August lambing ewes, which I'll focus on here, if you're a cattle person, August calving cows, you'd be 15 DSE, but August lambing crossbred ewes tend to have uh, multiple sets of twins. So lambing percentage is up around that 140, 150%. I would call them an average throughout the year of two DSE. And the reason I talk winter, winter DSEs is it's the time of year when feed is the tightest. And if we get through that period, then we tend to be we tend to be sailing smoothly come spring. So if you just keep in mind two DSE for a an August lambing ewe, if we're running an 800 hectare farm at 10 DSE, that means we've got capacity for 8,000 DSE. So typically, what that would look like is 3,000 ewes, for example. So two DSE per ewe. So 3,000. By two, we've got 6,000 DSE there, and typically there's some lambs that are carried over from the previous year. So if we said there's 2,000 lambs, which are one DSE each, we've got our 8,000 DSE capacity. So don't get too hung up on how we calculate that, but it's not that hard to find a reference. Uh, Evergraze is a great resource to go and, if you really want to hone into your DSEs at a particular time of year. But if you use two DSE for your use as a starting point, that's, that's a good place to begin. So from that, we can work out removal. So if we're running 10 DSE, we're removing half a kilo of phosphorus per hectare, uh, per DSE. So 10 DSE, five kilos of phosphorus removed per hectare, which equates to about 57 kilos of single super. So or across our 8,000 DSE, we're removing 4,000 kilos of P, which equates to about 45 tonne of single. So what that would look like on a 2,000 acre farm is that we'd be top dressing with single super at 120 kilos per year for half the farm for a maintenance rate. So if you want to build your phosphorus levels in the pasture phase and you're running 10 DSE or perhaps more, then you need to look at upping your fertilizer rates or potentially just doing more of your farm more regularly. So, and the reason that we're focused on that is again, just trying to get into this 35 to 45 coal wool P band so that we can, we can run we can produce essentially 90% or better of our potential production, and we can run these numbers 10 to 12 DSC, or if you really want to push the system, getting up towards 14, 15 DSC, which is certainly doable if you've got the right pasture species and you've got your, your pH, phosphorus, sulfur, um, all your ducks in a row. So a colleague of mine asked me, what about coming out of crop? So I just want to touch on that briefly. Um, I would say that the traditional approach uh, in our area and in many areas is build phosphorus during the cropping phase and run it down in the pasture phase. My response to that is, can we afford to? With current land values, with livestock values in particular, uh, and no doubt many of you listening are uh, focused on your livestock enterprise, can we afford to let that coal wall pea run down? So as you push west, so in my client base, as we push back closer to a 500 mil or even 450 mil rainfall, we'll tend to have, we'll build, do exactly that, build phosphorus in the cropping phase, but only have a very short pasture phase uh, of three to five years. So it's doable, but you need to know the risk you're taking and what you're managing in doing that. So if we come out of crop and we've got a coal wall P of 45, we're prepared to run that down to 35. So we're still going to stay roughly in that range of maximum production. We know we're running 10 DSE and we've got a five kilo removal of phosphorus per hectare per year. Over four years, let's say we've got a four year pasture phase, we're going to run that, we're going to decrease our coal wool P by about 10 units. So just a few numbers there to let you actually soak that in. Five kilos removal per hectare per year for four years. Five fours are 20. So we've got 20 kilos of removal out the gate over that four years. You can cut that in half and that's the coal wool P drop you will get. 
But I should say that will again vary relative to soil type, uh, phosphorus buffering index, and potentially rainfall and the DSEs you're running in your area. So the next part of that though is that because a lot of us certainly coming out of crop, at least for the first year, two years, we'll consider not applying single super. The trouble is when we come out of crop into pasture, they tend to be the best pastures we've got on the farm. And if you're anything like the farmers I deal with, if there's feed there, they tend to be sheep there or cattle there. So those pastures, instead of carrying an average of 10 DSE, which we might be running across the rest of the farm, they may be running an average of 14 DSE. So our removal starts to be much higher. So over that same four year period, we may then drop our coal wool pea by 14 units, or if it's the paddock that we've got sheep in more often than not, potentially our, our decrease is higher than that. So rather than getting too hung up on the numbers, know that if your plan is to run down that phosphorus base in the pasture phase, that you are potentially missing production. And the consequences of that, is what's it going to take to then build it back up? So we've got it. We know we need at least two kilos of excess phosphorus, whether this be in crop or pasture. We need at least two kilos, if not two and a half, to build that coal wool pea up by one unit. So I would suggest to you that the risk of running it down is too great. If you've got a good phosphorus base, then it's much easier to maintain it than to build it. So as a starting point, if you haven't taken soil tests for a while, it's you don't have to test every pasture paddock on your farm, but it's certainly good if you can head across and get a, a snapshot of your phosphorus reserve because it's going to be the fuel that's that's driving that engine and driving the production of your livestock system. So as I said at the start, it, it seems like a simple topic, but it's not as simple as phosphorus. But the beauty of soil testing is we test for more than one thing when we're going across the farm. So if you keep in mind pH as well, so on this particular farm, I think I mentioned on the Western block, these are the paddocks that have been out to pasture for a while and our pHs are starting to get a bit low. This is where we may start to see your legumes starting to struggle to perform the way they did when it first came out of crop. So I mentioned that by way of alluding to molybdenum. So molybdenum is a trace element that becomes important once you've got your phosphorus, sulfur and nitrogen right. If you are in acid country, Molybdenum is necessary or it's essential for legumes to fix nitrogen on acidic soils. So one in four years, you may want to consider adding molybdenum to your pasture fertiliser. If you have a pH of below about five, so commonly we, we're ranging between 4.8 and 5.5. And um, if you're in that pasture phase, you've got no plans to bring it back into crop and you want to maximise the bang for your buck out of phosphorus, then consider adding molybdenum to the mix. So just to recap, phosphorus and sulphur, but particularly phosphorus, are a major limiting factor of our pasture production. And they're a major limiting factor because they also drive the health of our legumes and, it, and by default, our nitrogen production. So if you take home nothing else from tonight, get out there, take some soil tests and assess your starting levels. So as I mentioned, do some soil testing. Once you've got that base understood for your pastures across your farm, calculate some DSEs and work out your removal. Start to think about your pasture composition. Um, and as you're coming out of crop, we've often got some recent soil tests, but start to think how you're going to manage that in your pasture phase. And obviously the numbers I've quoted will depend on the DSEs you're running uh, relative to your rainfall environment and your soil type. So um, if in doubt, seek some local advice. So I won't keep you much longer, but just my take homes from this evening, soil test regularly. You can't manage what you don't measure. Get a handle on your removal and then start to assess your pasture comp composition. So what I like to do with my clients once we've had a good suite of soil testing is do a drop around in the winter and give them a DSC rating. So typically that's a, it might be a rating out of 10, but if it's a really good paddock, it might be a rating out of 12 or 14. And then you can start to come up with some numbers of the pasture capacity and match that to the DSEs that you're trying to run on your farm. And once you've done that, create a list of priority paddocks and consider if you're in acidic country, consider molybdenum, adding that to your single super or something like triple plus. Uh, every one in four years on acid soils. 
And if all of that's been a bit of a blur to you, running through numbers, uh, is five easy steps to ensure you're making money from superphosphate is a great resource. It steps through pretty much step by step what we've talked about tonight from DSC ratings to assessing your removal. And uh, if you haven't had a look at that, I believe it was developed by CSIRO and the New South Wales DPI. It's a terrific resource to get your hands on. So, and failing that, happily uh, send me an email or give me a call. Or for that matter, if you're into social media, uh, check out Twitter. There's a lot of good um, pharma networks on social media. So uh, that's about me for this evening. Uh, if you have any questions, um, type them in and uh, Hilary, um, I'll get you to pass them on. No worries. Thanks so much for that, David. It was a really good oversight of our oh, insight into phosphorus in mixed farming. Um, and it was great that you looked into um, removal from um, uh, grazing as well as um, input from cropping. So thanks so much for that. I'll just give David a little bit of a break. Um, if you do have to head off early, you will be presented with a survey uh, as you exit the webinar. And this survey takes two to three minutes to complete and it just makes sure that uh, or provides feedback for MLA and uh, presenters like David and us at Aggregate to make sure that the webinars um, are relevant to you as producers. Um, so if you do have any questions, um, please send them in uh, right away so I can relay them to David. Um, and I will also note again that if you do have uh, or if you do want to watch a recording of this webinar, it is available on the MLA website, should be up by uh, Friday at the latest. Just a quick question to get started, uh, David. Um, do you ever substitute molybdenum for, with your, uh, uh, do you ever substitute molybdenum with your liming program? Uh as a rule, I don't. Um, if a paddock is coming back into crop, then typically we would lime it in our part of the world. Uh, molybdenum tends to be a tool to maximise the, both the longevity of the pasture. So quite often we'll have a paddock that we don't want to bring back into crop because the land class doesn't particularly suit. And we've noticed the sub clover content starting to drop off. Um, it's those sort of paddocks, or if we're seeing that, across a substantial area of the farm, that's when we might add some molybdenum into the mix. But if you're, if you're going to bring it back into crop soon anyway, if you have a shorter planned rotation, you may not need to do that. But um, yeah, we also typically use molybdenum in the cropping rotation um, in canola in particular. Thank you, thanks for that first question. Uh, the next one, where do you find the five easy steps resource? Would you just be able to find it online? Yeah, if you just Google five easy steps superphosphate, uh, it will come up. Um, it's referred to a lot. Um, people have written papers since, but it, yeah, it's pretty easy to track down. Just type it into Google. Yeah, someone's just also written in. It is on the MLA website uh, also. So if you type you go. the search box at MLA, you'll be able to find it. Uh, the next question, what are non-synthetic phosphorus options available? Uh, Non-synthetic options, basically you're looking at manures. So um, for example, I have a customer who has a pig farm. Um, they don't use any synthetic fertilizers. Their cropping and pasture program is all, all, done, by, uh, all done by pig manure. I have customers who use chook manure likewise. Uh, I also have a couple who use biosolids, which is human waste out of Sydney. So um, yeah, to my knowledge, uh, Manures would be your, your next best bet if you if you're not looking to go down the synthetic fertilizer path. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next question: Do you know of any adverse effects of applying phosphorus to microbiology of the soil? Uh, look, I don't. Um, again, there's another really good trial done by the DPI near Yass. Um, it was an alter alternative fertilizer trial, so. Um, single super was their base to compare to. They used manure, uh, look, you name it, they tried it. Um, they tried to measure microbial activity in that, I'm reasonably sure. Um, I would have to, I can get a link to um, 
Hillary to that information, but uh, alternative fertiliser trial run by the New South Wales DPI near Yass. Um, as much as that is, is a commonly quoted concern, um, I think driving our system, if we can fuel biomass in our pasture system, we can improve organic matter. If we can improve organic matter cycling through the system, then I, I think microbial activity tends to take care of itself. So um, I'm sure it's possible if you over fertilize to do some harm, but I think we've got to, because we're forever taking nutrition out of the system, whether it be by sheep or grain or cattle for that matter, um, I don't think we put enough on to actually have that problem. But um, yeah, smarter people than me may tend to disagree, but uh, certainly the uh, alternative fertilizer trial that was done near Yass would be a good resource to, um, to check some science on that. Thanks, David. Uh, the next question, uh, we have always emphasised pea application in first year pastures. Our agron agronomist believes that high pea is important for young pasture development. Do you agree? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'd probably do a bit of that myself. Um, it would only be, I mean, I, I talked about that uh, mining of the phosphorus reserve if you're excess of 45. I would typically only do that if you're coming back with a number that's uh, 60, 70, really in the, or, or even getting up as high as 90. Um, yeah, when you're trying to, particularly if you cover crop, that first year of establishment or the, the first year out of crop, um, a little bit of fertiliser, even when your test is saying that it's a pretty good result, a little bit of fertiliser seems to just kick it into gear and really help it establish. So, um, yes, short answer, I'm in favour of that as well. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks for that question. There haven't been any more come through yet, David. I'll just give it another few seconds just to make sure there are no final questions. Uh, so if you do have one, please send them through uh, as soon as possible. All right. No, that seems to be it for this evening. So thank you everyone for attending tonight's webinar. We had a great rollout. Um, the next webinar is actually next week. We're not having a break. It's not in a fortnight's time. It's actually next week with Tim Prance, uh, who's talking about um, sowing clovers in pastures for Southern Systems. Uh, so if you're around Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Um, Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time, uh, next week, uh, that is the webinar we're going to be touching on then. Thanks very much again, David. Great webinar um, and thanks for being a part of this evening's um, talk, everyone. Um, just a lot of thank yous coming in now. All right. Thanks, everyone.